good from my end. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Ashford. I am CEO of two of the UK's leading impact investing platforms, FX and Energize Africa. Welcome to our webinar today on Beyond Renewable Energy for All, how off-grid solar access in Africa is key to achieving at least nine of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I've got a great panel with me today and um, based on the feedback that we had at the last session as well, we have, I'm pleased to say, got some excellent representatives um, who are sitting in regional offices in Africa as well, so we can get a real flavour of some of the regional differences um, and business models. This might be your first opportunity to actually meet some of the businesses, um, uh, which is great. So thank you everyone for joining us. I will just um, basically run through who we have here with us on our panel. Uh, and then I will ask them to uh, introduce themselves very briefly. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, what the situation is in terms of uh, rollout of pay-as-you-go solar in Africa at the moment and how, what a critical role it's playing, um, just in general, but also in a time of, of COVID and, and post-COVID. Uh, and then we're going to look more widely at some of the benefits of solar in terms of how we're achieving, um, helping to achieve some of the sustainable development goals. Um, so firstly, um, thank you to um, Rebecca from Power For All for joining us. If you could just wave so people know who you are. Uh, and Sneha from uh, Azuri Technologies, welcome Sneha. Uh, we've got Desoke from Nigeria, from the Ulu office, and Tobias from the Energize Africa investments team. So perhaps in that order, could I just briefly introduce yourselves and, and uh, what you do, and then we'll kick off and just have a bit of a general chat about um, state of solar uh, at the moment in, in Africa. So, um, Rebecca, if you'd like to go first. Sure thing. Hope you can hear me all right. The mic is a little bit low. <laughs> um, but hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Rebecca Shirley. I'm the Chief of Research at Power for All, which is a nonprofit organization focused on energy access across sub Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia. So, we do a lot of work actually quite at a, at a number of the intersections that we're about to talk about today. So, very, very thankful to be here, Lisa. Thank you very much. And we'll go to Sneha next. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Hello, everyone from uh, a cold and gloomy Nairobi. Um, yes, so um, I run the Africa operations uh, for a company called Azuri Technologies. Uh, we are headquartered uh, in uh, Cambridge uh, in the UK. Um, we've so far connected more than uh, 200,000 households uh, in Africa and we're growing very fast. Uh, we were ranked uh, 233rd fastest growing company uh, as per the Financial Times last year and just last Sunday, we were ranked as the uh, fast, 40th fastest growing uh, company in the UK. Um, so we're very excited uh, in this space and uh, making a real difference, not only um, on power, uh, but also the other SDG goals, which uh, I really look forward to discussing uh, with the panel today. Thanks very much. Just okay. Hello, thanks, Lisa. Um, uh, my name is Dosake. I um, work with a company called Ulu, and uh, we're an SHS distribution company. We are headquarters in... Uh, Dakar, Senegal, and we have operations in six countries, uh, Niger, Cameroon, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Mali, um, and Senegal, of course. Um, we currently um, operate in Nigeria in about 22 states out of 36 states in Nigeria, and we primarily target uh, customers at the bottom of the pyramid, um, as well as customers that are peri um, Happy to be on the panel. Thank you. Lovely. And Tobias? Yeah, thanks, uh, Lisa. Hi, guys. Um, so this is Tobias calling from, uh, from Amsterdam. Um, I am the head of investments of both Energize Africa and uh, Lenderhand. Um, not going to go into much detail there because presumably you know what Energize Africa is all about, financing companies uh, that are doing the awesome work on the ground, such as Ulu and uh, Azuri Technologies. So uh, happy to be here. Great. Thanks, everyone. Yes. And um, in terms of the people who are, are viewing us at the moment, we've probably got 
a mix actually some of our existing investors who may be interested in meeting some of the businesses uh, some people who may have heard about energize africa and they want to just learn some more about what we do uh, and probably some industry experts as well who um, would like to uh, maybe refresh their knowledge or uh, just would like to connect in with some of the great um, panelists that we have here. So welcome everyone. We'll try and uh, answer your questions as they come in. Uh, you can submit them via the chat function on the right and uh, I'll try and feed those into the uh, discussion and if not we'll do a quick uh, fire Q&A towards the end. We have 45 minutes scheduled and uh, we can run to an hour if, if we want to, uh, and we generally do. And um, just to say this isn't a financial promotion in any way and shouldn't be seen as financial advice, um, but if you would like to get more information, we will be sending out a email after the um, event, which might have some resources included. Uh, but please do also visit the website Energize Africa. Thank you very much. Housekeeping done. So let's kick off then um, and let's talk. I'm going to ask um, Rebecca to give us the, the overview um, to start to really think about how critical um, solar access uh, or energy access from solar is um, in Africa. And I mean, there's a huge need, obviously, for clean and affordable energy in Africa. Um, that was obvious um, prior to COVID, perhaps has become even more um, prominent in terms of its need um, highlighted by COVID. So perhaps Rebecca, you could just give us an overview there. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I think that um, one message that, um, you know, Power for All and other organizations like us have been um, leading with the past couple of years, in fact, we've been around for, for five years, is about um, the fact that what we're trying to do with the SDGs as a collective community is not just think about energy access as a means to its own end, but rather a means to many other ends, um, you know, as exactly as we've um, identified as the topic for today's discussion. So um, solar energy is really important, not just for electrification of households for, um, for lighting, but what our research has been showing is that there's actually many areas of uh, direct uh, influence um, from, solar, from solar energy, whether it's through solar home systems or through mini grids um, or otherwise. So we're seeing a lot of potential advancement in the agriculture space. We've also done a lot of research that shows us about the uh, jobs creation potential from the sector as well. Um, so I think that you're starting to see now um, a lot more uh, focus on uh, renewables as part of the electrification strategy. Um, we couldn't say that just a few years ago. Uh, in fact, still as of 2017, uh, 40, only 40% of sub-Saharan African countries have official rural electrification targets, and only a third of those have decentralized renewable energy targets or plans included. So it's, there's still quite a long way to go, but we're definitely seeing a change in the... Um, in the way that uh, renewables ha are coming more to the center of electrification um, plans and, and strategies. Uh, just in terms of an overview of where the continent sits, there's lots of fantastic reports that have come out recently by Gogla, IEA, AMDA has just put out a report, SMAP, et cetera, that really help us get a sense of how many of these different types of um, systems do we have really across the continent. And just to give you a flavor, um, I think according to Gogla, there's about 4 million uh, solar lanterns um, and solar home systems uh, across the sold across the continent just from January to June of, of, of last year 2019 uh, they're coming out with the results for this year um, fairly soon and then uh, another likewise uh, almost a million uh, off-grid solar appliances were sold in that same period and then a great report from SMAP that came out last year showed us that there's about 1,500 mini grids across the continent that are currently installed and 4,000 more uh, planned so you can sort of get a sense of, yes, it's early days, but also there's, there is a significant amount of movement. And I'm sure um, uh, Dosike and, and Sanhar will be able to um, uh, elaborate on that. Um, on the point of view of uh, how this becomes even more important uh, in, the, in the age of COVID, I think we're actually seeing quite a lot of um, writing coming out on this exact topic. Um, it's a little bit difficult to say right now what the impact to the, uh, to, um, 
to companies and to their customers has been. There's just, you know, we're still waiting for more data to come in. Um, uh, there's lots of surveying happening, uh, lots of data being collected by companies themselves. Um, and, and pieces of that are coming out in a piecemeal fashion, but we're still waiting for really a good sense of exactly what the, what the challenge um, looks like. What I can say though, is that a number of companies um, uh, off-grid solar energy companies in particular are identifying a lack of finance uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, a challenge to access finance to, to bear through these times as a, as a major challenge. Um, and another thing that we're seeing, is, besides the sort of the impact to the companies themselves and their sustainability, um, we're seeing sort of a general consensus coming out from the donor and humanitarian community um, that aside from the COVID outbreak, which of course is affecting supply chains, um, here in East Africa, we're seeing the locust swarms. Of course, we just had the second wave of that. Um, the flooding, even if you're not here in East Africa, I'm sure you're seeing about the flooding that's happening in, um, in Somalia, uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia, etc. So food security is becoming quite an issue. And uh, according to some of the latest uh, uh, thinking on this, that the number of persons who are in food insecure in this region, in East Africa, could double just this year alone from some 2 million to, to over 40 million. Um, so definitely there's a role um, and an, 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 in, an increased role, I would say, for uh, renewables to step in and, and support on, on food security. So later on in the conversation, we can expand on that a bit more. Okay, brilliant. That, I think that really sets the context. And, and before I jump down into um, talking to the businesses specifically, perhaps it's worth Tobias just very quickly uh, outlining from a platform point of view who is providing the, the some of the flexible finance that the businesses need uh, to, to grow how we've managed um, the situation from a covid point of view uh, and, and then we'll talk to the businesses yeah sure thanks uh, thanks lisa and uh, thank you rebecca for setting um Look, I think you know we're 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 a few months in now, so we've um, we've we've got a lot more data, we've got a lot more information, uh, we've got a lot better picture of um, of how the market is moving, I guess, and how the companies are faring um, in these challenging times. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty. There's still a lot of things we don't know, um, uh, and and you start to see, uh, you know, effects that were you know are let's say caused by by COVID implications. Um, you're starting to see them now, and, and that is a bit later than we anticipated before. Um, so when, uh, let's say, you know, um, uh, also in the Netherlands, but let's say the um, in March when COVID really took off um, and, and countries started to go into lockdown more, um, more pressingly, the uh, we figured that most of the severe impact would be caused a few months and not uh, six months after. So. Um, we're still seeing companies that we thought were actually doing quite well and we're managing these challenging times fairly well. Um, you know, you st you're starting to see those effects now, um, which again is later than we anticipated before. Um, and then we have to wonder, like, how is that um, compared to, uh, you know, companies in their own sector, in their own markets, countrywide, how do they compare? How do they stack up? Um, what are the key differences? What is driving that? Um, and there's still not, not a clear answer to that, um, in, at least in, in, in our view, when we look at um, our portfolio clients. Um, good thing is that these, most of the companies are really um, you know, adaptable, they're dynamic, they can change quickly uh, to uh, changing market conditions. Uh, they're quite creative when it comes to how they should manage their liquidity, for example, but also how to manage their, uh, their lender relations, um, looking at the, on the equity side as well. There's, there's, Quite some support in this sector, which uh, which I think is a good thing, um, especially because it's needed, right? Um, you desperately see companies struggling, and it's up to the stakeholders, in that sense, to show their support. And um, I think that's the beauty of this um, this impact investing space that we are in as a as, as a platform. Um, most lenders and investors we speak to are quite. Uh, pragmatic they're quite accommodating they're quite flexible the discussions are very transparent and ultimately all of us are in the same boat and we're in you know we're, we're, we hope to come out of this stronger in the end um, unfortunately it's they're 
there's going to be casualties, um, whether that's purely COVID related or whether there were more structural underlying issues, you know, that's to be seen, um, I guess, but COVID is definitely not take, making things easier. Um, we do have the hope that for the ones that do survive, you know, they really do come out stronger. Um, and, and perhaps with that in mind, uh, quickly passing the ball to, uh, to, to company representatives to see how they've been faring. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think uh, you make an interesting point there that perhaps we'll come back to in terms of the uh, sector support that has quite uh, rapidly mobilised to make sure that companies have got uh, enough resource to continue through some of the difficult times. Uh, you know, we've seen a number of the larger institutional funders and charitable foundations really quickly pull together to put together, um, you know, emergency support funds uh, for for the organisations, which which has been excellent. So um, I'll, I'll turn to Desoke first. If if you could give us an overview, perhaps of how your business has been uh, expanding, maybe pre-COVID, and then you know how have you adapted, and and what are you seeing now? Um, thanks again, Lisa. Um, so in uh, Ulu, Nigeria, I'm, I'll talk a bit more about Ulu, Nigeria um, versus Ulu as a group. And uh, before COVID, you know, we were at about, there are a total of about 36 states in Nigeria. So we're about 18 states with the goal of expanding to about 30 states this year. Um, so we had a run rate that we're gradually, you know, um, increasing on, on a regular basis and having a diversified portfolio of multiple products to to our customers at the bottom of the pyramid. So we're targeting residential micro businesses, um, very rural uh, primary health care healthcare centers and schools in rural or, or, or peri-urban areas. Um, and we're gradually increasing, increasing that. We're able to expand to 22 states and before COVID, and we had to pull back in terms of market expansion. Um, so we're not gonna hit the target for, to reach about 30 states this year. Um, we provide basic lighting solutions, solar TV solutions, uh, solar inverters, and again, it's to support our customers so that they not just meet their basic needs of having um, lights to either run their businesses or their children to read um, at school or after school, uh, but also targeting businesses so that uh, they can actually see value in the product and can see that value because it helps them earn more money. Um, with COVID, we initially saw a, a, a reduction in our revenues. Um, we expected that revenue to dip a lot more than we it, it would we we thought, uh, you know, as as the as the pandemic continued. And I think that dip was probably tied to uh, restrictions in terms of uh, the lockdown. So if people are not moving around and cannot earn a living, then it's more difficult for them to, to purchase products or to, to make that. As time has gone on, we've seen uh, repayments dip, um, and that's just because customers cannot afford um, to, to pay for some of these products. And as their incomes have also dropped, they've had to reprioritize um, in their families, you know, should I feed my children today or should I pay for energy access? And I, I think feeding their families always trumps uh, paying for energy access. So we've seen that even customers that have been loyal, that have been dedicated, are beginning to default. Um, we are trying to, uh, we've tried to offer some, some initiatives to them, such as giving them energy, free energy days, reducing flexibility in payments, uh, to just get them on board. Um, but the bottom line is if they don't have the money, they don't have the money. Uh, and it's been tough. And, and I think that is one area that, that uh, uh, investors or people interested in the space could look at in terms of what kind of grants can we give to customers who have been loyal to businesses, but for economic reasons, they just can't afford to make the last three months of payments. You know, they, it's not fair for them to lose the assets. Um, and, but as social enterprises, we also have business goals. So we can't write off everything, uh, otherwise we will not be in business. Um, so that, that has been our experience so far, um, looking at making sure that our sales team, uh, we managing a national distributed network 
it's very difficult managing a distributed sales team in, in, in 22 states is difficult making sure that they're safe uh, it's priority to us as a business uh, supply chain internally and globally has been difficult for us in terms of uh, uh, of inventory um, and being able to meet uh, customer demands uh, as well and again that that is one area that doesn't make logical sense that you for most investors to say we're not going to give more money until we see the results but sometimes you need to get the inventory and keep on selling to be able to see the results so it, it's it's really tough because you're, tr you're you're trying to hit those revenue targets you're trying to hit those profitability targets but if you don't have the inventory to keep on pushing um, you're not going to hit them um, and so it's constantly a balancing act uh, for us as a business and that has been uh, our experience so far well, I take my hat off to you because it sounds extremely challenging to manage that uh, type of business at the best of times, let alone with a you know, uh, world pandemic. Um, thank you. We, we've got some questions coming in. Please do send in some more questions as we're talking. Uh, there's a question around uh, clean cooking, which we will come to a bit later. And there's another question around um, galvanizing support from uh, diaspora and we'll come back to that as well so uh, if I can come to Sneha now to give us an overview of um, of how Azuri has been adapting um, and and the latest from you sure sure um, would love to so um, the good thing is that uh, pre-COVID um, we had uh, been uh, quite uh, well uh, prepared to fight this obviously then we didn't uh, see this coming uh, but uh, towards the end of last year um, we got funded by a very big uh, Japanese uh, conglomerate uh, called uh, Marubeni um, and this was sort of uh, one of the first few corporate investments uh, into our sector. You know, before that, uh, we've been backed by a lot of uh, venture capital. Um, and, you know, this was a milestone for us uh, to basically prove um, our, our business model uh, is, is profitable. And, of course, uh, as well. Uh, also, the way we have operated Azuri, um, we believe, you know, it's been... Uh, our strategy has been to be quite uh, agile. Um, so we've differentiated a lot um, compared to many of our competitors, you know, who have raised, uh, I would say, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to, to develop uh, their uh, supply chains, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, whereas in our case, um, uh, I mean, the whole company, um, you know, eight years old uh, is uh, less than uh, 70 people. Um, and we're able to do that because uh, we strike um, a very good uh, strategic partnerships with uh, local distributors. Uh, who have uh, the know-how and infrastructure that uh, uh, we, we, we ride on. Uh, and also from a financing point of view, I know um, uh, our other uh, panelists uh, mentioned um, some of the financing challenges. Um, in our case, um, uh, you know, with our partners like uh, Lend a Hand, et cetera, we have innovated al also a lot uh, in terms of financing to make it very scalable. And, and what we do is we do off-balance sheet um, financing. So, so that means that um, um, the, the portfolios themselves, based on their performance, uh, they're able to attract additional uh, debt uh, capital as well. So with, with that kind of um, way of operating, uh, we were able to, and we are able to ride out the, the pandemic uh, much better. Uh, now, out of Nairobi, I run uh, four countries, um, which is Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Zambia. And uh, each of the countries um, have been uh, impacted differently, and, and the governments have had different uh, strategies. And also, we've been able to adapt um, appropriately to those. Um, I must say, uh, Tanzania has been quite uh, difficult um, because of the, the radical um, way that the government has, uh, has treated uh, that market. Um, look at uh, Kenya and Zambia, um, it's been uh, striking the right uh, balance as well. So, you know, th there was um, the, the right level of lockdowns that were put in place, but also to enable the economy to, to operate. Uh, and then Uganda is the other extreme where there was a very tight lockdown, which um, hurt the economies as well. Um, so we've been, um, with our local distributors, we've been able to uh, basically navigate 
um, to, to adapt to those uh, different situations. Um, and in fact, um, uh, COVID uh, in a way has brought some uh, opportunities um, for us as well, because you know, despite um, the, the pandemic, um, energy um, and, and the other sort of indirect benefits energy has, um, uh, is actually benefiting um, the, the rural uh, customer. So um, we will talk about this uh, a bit later, but uh, just to give a quick example uh, in terms of uh, education. So over the last five, six months, uh, all the schools have been closed uh, in Kenya. So um, the national uh, curriculum, the education is delivered through uh, the, the local uh, TV channels and uh, all our TVs are integrated with uh, satellite. So we actually saw a spike in demand for our products. Um, and, and because of the need for these kind of things, uh, we've actually seen uh, generally our repay, repayment rates uh, to be quite uh, stable. Um, so these are kind of um, you know, good uh, indications uh, for us to ride out um, the current uh, disruptions. A couple of questions um, that have come in uh, with regards just clarifying what what is the situation for for the end customers um, but before that just to say that uh, Energize Africa ha has been um, refinancing a number of the um, tranches of investment that were due for repayment so uh, instead of the company uh, needing to find that finance, we're essentially refinancing again. And um, we're also giving a longer grace period before the first capital and interest payment is made. Um, and perhaps uh, both organizations could just tell us how they've been dealing with the, with the end customer specifically. Um, and, and someone just asked quickly before, before we come to that, how is Energize Africa or Lender Hand Ethics funded? Uh, so just a bit of background. We actually um, came about because uh, DFID put out a, a tender to launch a new platform uh, to find and use flexible, uh, innovative forms of finance to help accelerate energy access in sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, SX and Lenderhand uh, came together actually to um, form a joint venture. Both were shortlisted individually and we decided stronger together. So we formed a partnership to launch Energize Africa with the backing of uh, DFID, Virgin Unite, and we most recently have had support from um, P4G, which is partnering for green growth um, for startup and scale up as well. We do charge businesses uh, that list a fee, obviously, for um, we need to be sustainable as well financially. Um, that is built into their overall funding cost uh, and still gives an affordable, uh, I would hope uh, the others would agree, uh, an affordable price of finance, which is, which is quite flexible. Um, so just to answer that question, but if you could give us um, uh, Sneha first, perhaps uh, uh, the response to how are you dealing uh, to individuals who are struggling to pay? You said that generally the payment rates have been okay, but how do you deal with, with those that are struggling? Sure, sure. So um, this is quite a sensitive topic um, because you know, we need to be careful that uh, by giving subsidies for a short period, um, we don't uh, totally ruin and, and spoil the market. Um, and, you know, if, for example, if, if subsidies were given for three months, then there could be, and we've seen this in our experience before, there would be an expectation from customers to continue paying uh, those uh, subsidized rates. And of course, you know, we are there to make sure that the model is, is commercially um, sustainable. But, but having said that, um, we, we do uh, provide uh, support uh, where it's required. Um, so, you know, in our case, um, we... We, we don't only rely on technology, but our distributors have um, agents on the ground uh, whose role is not only to sell the, the, the initial systems, but to um, basically handhold the customers to, to help them uh, repay as well. 
Um, and some, something that we've um, rolled out in the past few months is a, sort of a savings uh, product as well, because typically um, our uh, repayment was on a, on a weekly basis, and, and sometimes customers don't have those lump sum amounts to pay. Uh, so what we've launched um, is a sort of a savings plan where uh, customers are able to contribute to like an e-wallet uh, on a daily basis. So, you know, it's equivalent of um, 50 US cents a day that, that they would um, you know, put into the wallet. And as soon as it reaches um, a seven days equivalent, um, then they get the, the code um, to, to purchase for the lighting or the, or the TV product. So, you know, in, in, that, in those ways, we've innovated to give sort of flexible uh, repayment terms to our customers. Thank you. And Dasoke, how have you dealt with, with that? Um, so, um... The, the Nigerian market is a bit different from even other West African markets. In terms of the customers, they like cash. They like to hold cash. They like to deal in cash. So it's, it's been a challenge to even um, get them to use electronic payment systems, to get them to use any kind of USSD codes. I mean, they, they would go uh, disabled, for example, and when you go to repossess, they're like, well, you didn't come to collect the money. That's why I didn't pay. Um, you know, and that's, that's an additional cost to the business, you know, cost that we may probably have not factored in in our, in our business modeling. So there's something that Tobias said that, was, that, that essentially just, you know, reflects the kind of business that we're on. We are adaptable and we are flexible. So we have a direct sales force that goes to the customer. We deal with the customers ourselves. Our employees or, uh, or, or our resellers, they deal with the customers directly. And so we try as much as possible to engage with them, understand what their, their, their needs are, what their challenges are. Our customer journey engages with the customer from once we onboard them to having welcome calls to following up with them to find out when they're due for payments, why are they gonna be able to pay, why they're not able to pay. So by being engaged with the customer uh, intimately, we're able to understand where the challenges are and are able to prefer solutions uh, quickly. Um, the fact that, you know, Ulu is very lean as a company and we're more efficient in terms of capital deployment. Um, it means that, you know, we're, we, we don't have a lot of fat and we don't have a lot of baggage to carry in terms of cost. And so we're able to transfer some of these to the customers. Um, one of the things that we've done is offering the customer flexibility. Again, some insight into the profile of customers in Nigeria. So a customer, a typical customer in Nigeria is not used to credit. So even if I go to the customer and I say, you know, you can't afford to pay cash or you can't afford to pay an annual plan, let me put you on a monthly plan so that you pay more than their response. You know, why should I pay 15% if I can save the money by myself and buy cash? So we don't have a credit culture. And so it, it means we, we, we have to constantly be looking for ways to work with the customer. We partner with cooperatives. So we, we've started working with cooperatives, microfinance banks, to make, to, because they are used, people are, uh, bought, customers at the bottom of the pyramid are more comfortable dealing with these kinds of organizations. So we partner with them to get them to transfer the, the uh, to sell the assets and manage the assets uh, with these customers directly. We offer them some free credit days um, so that they can they can just get some reprieve and then they come on they come back on. We offer them flexibility in terms of the actual amount of monthly repayments uh, that they need to make, just so that they it 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 helps them to be able to continue. The reality is we cannot dissociate the customer from the economic realities that they're facing. The economic reality in this region is that there's inflation. The economic reality is that the Naira has def devaluated. The economic reality is that the customer's wallets have shrunk. So these are the realities, okay? And um, it, it, it will be impossible to separate my humanity from the business model and say, you know, I just want them to deliver. Uh, I, and I can't tell you that this is, the, this is the right solution or this is the way, but what we're committed to do is is to constantly speak to the customer, engage with them and work with them to find the best way to continue to get them using these facilities as well as, as making sure that we continue to exist as a business. Um, but those are some of the things that we've had to do and, and engage directly with the customer uh, in, in order to, to make sure that they are still using the products 
um, and, and that we're able to meet our business objective. The second thing we've also done is for our existing products, we're constantly looking of how can we reposition them as productive use equipment. So for example, we sell a typical lighting product that comes with lights, a radio, uh, a panel, and a battery. So that typically we used to push as a residential solution. So have it in your home or in your house, and you, it can have lights and charge your phone and have a radio. What we've said to ourselves, roadside barbers, so there are lots of roadside barbers in Nigeria. A roadside barber, what does he need? He just needs the light. He just needs the radio for music for his customers when they come. And he needs a USB to be able to charge his, his clipper. So repurposing some of the equipment that we have or the systems that we have to show them in a more productive use light. Because when we're able to do that, then customers are able to continue to pay because that's how they earn a living. Uh, they can see that, yes, you know, it's not just a lighting solution, but I can make money, I can improve my standard of living and my well-being by using these products in a different way. So we're looking at repos repurposing our, 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 our products, finding new customer segments, uh, trying to show the customer a different way of using them so that they can earn a living. They, they like the product, they, they see the effect in terms of, 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 the, of the, on the health of their, of their children and their family. The alternative is using petrol generators and they, they see the benefit of it, but yeah. if they don't have the money, they don't have the money. And yeah. so we need to work with them to, to help them also you know, earn uh, using our product as well. Which, which is a brilliant segue because I want to start talking about, you know, we, we focus a lot on energy access. Um, and as Rebecca clearly said, you know, there, there are much broader benefits that uh, we're seeing where economic uh, enablement and, and, and growth, um, giving people the ability to uh, basically feed their families by starting uh, a, a new business and being entrepreneurial uh, is, is actually almost at the center of, you know, pay as you go solar um, to some extent. Um, Sneha, how are you diversifying and how do you see the uh, different SDGs coming into play with the, with the products that you have and, and what you're doing? Sure, sure. So um, first of all, um, people from the outside might see us as a sort of a niche uh, solar company. We're not uh, just that. Uh, and you know our name says says it. So uh, you know it's a it's a wide ranging name. Um, Azuri Technologies. Um, you know there the, the three things that uh, we're looking to drive. One is uh, of course the decentralization of energy, which is what uh, Rebecca touched on, which is what we're doing. We're doing it in a clean way by decarbonizing. And and, and the third, which is you know a, a global trend, um, which is uh, digitization uh, as well. Um, so, you know, if we take um, uh, each of the SDGs in turn, um, starting with health, um, and, you know, health is a big factor, especially for uh, rural Africa, um, and our, our clean solar energy um, already gives a lot of benefits uh, in terms of the, the kerosene uh, displacement um, as well. Um, but uh, we have gone a step further and, you know, we, we have a very wide uh, distribution network uh, out there. Um, you know, per country, we have uh, thousands of agents who are serving, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of customers. Um, and there are uh, many other companies who want to get access to, to that uh, distribution channel, which, uh, you know, we've uh, built up uh, uh, over time. So um, in Kenya, we've uh, partnered with one of the largest insurance companies. Uh, to provide uh, micro insurance uh, cover. Uh, so we provide a hospitalization and a funeral cover uh, to our customers for as little as a premium of um, a, a, a dollar a week. Um, and that is bundled in uh, with our um, uh, solar repayments as well. Um, and also we've ensured that, uh, you know, that cover uh, covers for, for COVID as well. So that is one example of, um, you know, how we have uh, diversified. Um, when it comes to um, knowledge sharing, um, uh, we're, we're already doing that um, by, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, as much as half of our um, sales are for, for solar TV. So we're moving up uh, what we call the energy ladder, where we started by just providing basic uh, lighting and, and phone charging, uh, but now we're providing TV and, and every single TV that we sell um, is bundled with uh, the satellite dish 
um, and content as well. And what we found is uh, in rural Africa, uh, the terrestrial TV signals are, are not um, so reliable. So with satellite, you know, we, we're guaranteeing uh, the, the quality of service um, and um, all our TV packages uh, come bundled with as many as uh, 60 channels, uh, local channels, um, documentaries, education, um, etc. So, so that is also, uh, you know, benefiting uh, in terms of uh, educating the, the rural uh, population as well. And I talked uh, earlier about uh, in terms of the, the benefits during the COVID period um, with the national curriculum also being aired uh, on, on TV as well. Um, then um, the, the other important um, uh, SDG is uh, in terms of gender equality. Uh, that is something we, we take very, very seriously. Um, so um, uh, as a beginning of uh, this year, um, uh, only about a third of our Asian network uh, were from the female gender. Um, and we launched a, um, a initiative called uh, Brighter Lives uh, with a commitment that uh, this year, um, at least uh, half of our uh, new, new agents uh, would, would be coming uh, from a sort of a balanced uh, gender approach. So, so that is something that we're taking uh, very seriously as well. And uh, we have a partnership with uh, Unilever uh, where uh, we are co-branding our products, but um, you know we we have a common goal uh, in terms of um, addressing the gender uh, equality. Um, so we are recruiting and, and training uh, the women entrepreneurs um, uh, together. Um, so, so so those are just some of the examples. And, and lastly, um, I, I know Doseke has talked about the productive use. Uh, that is also a very important um, avenue for us. Uh, so in Uganda, uh, we have a, a a partnership with the UNCDF. Um, and we partnered with the, one of the largest uh, pump manufacturers um, uh, in the world, um, an Italian company called Lorenz. Um, uh, and we're doing uh, solar irrigation pumps, um, uh, which are microfinanced um, with about 3,000 farmers in, in Uganda. So I hope that gives a breadth of the different uh, uh, diversification that we're doing. Yeah, perfect. And, and Tobias, just a, a wider perspective amongst the the other investees that we work with, um, to what extent are we seeing growth in productive use of solar and, and how it's enabling some of these other SDGs to uh, benefits to come forward? Yeah, I think you see uh, and, and, and the example of, uh, of SNEAR just now with respect to Azuri, um, you know, you start to see many companies now diversifying their product offering. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, a few of the, the, the companies we, we look at and work with, they started with your basic lighting systems. And then as they scaled, they saw customers wanting other type of products, bigger products, especially, um, I guess, uh, the bigger the TV, the better, uh, for which they need bigger systems. Um, but it also, you know, it takes into account um, the type of customer segments. If you go to the more rural areas, uh, farming is you know the, the most widespread activity of income generation, I guess. So, um, if you are focusing on rural households, you are almost per definition focusing on on farming households, right? Um, they tend to need lighting systems, yes, um, and 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 you know the bigger again the better uh, because it uh, you know TV offers. Uh, recreational purposes but it also offers education you know be connected with the outside um internationally even um but if you can then also look at their um, their income generating activities you know if you can help them in that respect become more efficient um you know uh, become more diversified themselves as a farmer uh, that that definitely helps and you see a lot of companies um um, either specializing into a certain element or a certain supply chain element or a certain product, um, but most of them we tend to see them diversifying away from pure lighting systems, um, moving up the energy ladder, but also, um, and, and that's with respect to the size, but also with respect to um, you know, how you can use these systems and what to use them for. Yeah, thank you. And I remember um, when I was in Uganda, uh, we also was out talking to families and, and getting some good case studies and just being able to charge your mobile phone uh, to be able to get access to information, find out what uh, price uh, they could sell their crops for, and also that whole sort of financial inclusion piece uh, was actually really important uh, to, to some of the households as well. So um, time is, is cracking on. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'd really like to talk about slightly change flip to the other side now. We've talked a little bit about um, 
the the renewables part of the business but what about the investment uh, and in fact the investors that are helping to to fund the businesses um, and a couple of questions have come up and actually it was on my list of things to talk about as well is is how can we engage more individuals in in europe it doesn't have to be just in europe could be in africa as well uh, to uh, help fund these amazing businesses and how could we engage more diaspora into uh, uh, funding them and investing and being much more engaged? Um, uh, Rebecca, do you have you done any work with with engaging diaspora, for instance? Um, I think uh, what I would say there is that the climate <clears throat> right now, uh, although it would seem like a, an environment that would that investors would shy away from. What we're seeing, a lot of surveys have been done recently. There was a, a great one uh, published by Africa Business um, just a few weeks ago that's actually showing that investors, while they are worried about the fallout, are actually remaining pretty confident uh, generally about the prospects of the off-grid energy sector, but also the renewable energy sector more broadly. Um, so what we're seeing is that um, many investors are seeing that even though oil prices are low, they're still likely to invest in solar, um, off-grid, uh, mini-grids, and actually bypass state-led generation and distribution companies um, to reach to reach end users directly. Of course, there are a number of risks um, around, uh, you know, political intervention, project discovery, tariffs, a lot of the issues that we talked about before, but generally uh, the climate that we're seeing, at least from the investors, donors that we are directly partnered with and from the research uh, is showing a fairly favorable climate right now. I can't speak directly to, uh, to Diaspora, unfortunately, Lisa. We don't, I, I don't think we have too many partners in that space that I could say um, that we've directly reached out to to assess their, their, the, the environment or the mm. outlook for them right now. Okay. Uh, just reflecting what we've seen on, on the platform, actually, is that um, because money has still been uh, coming back from, from businesses, over time, um, but we've had less investment opportunities. When we are bringing the refinance uh, uh, projects and, and campaigns to the platform, I mean, they are closing in a matter of hours um, because there's, there's so much demand still from our retail investors um, to, to put their money to good use. And because people have been at home, those who still have a job and have a secure income actually have uh, more disposable income um, and are looking at where they should be putting that. Uh, and I think, you know, it's given us all time to think about perhaps what some of the important things are uh, in our lives and, and an opportunity to think more widely about, you know, beyond our front door as well. So, uh, we've certainly seen quite strong demand still and uh, quite excited. Am I allowed to announce, Tobias, that we're, we're going to be opening up uh, new exposures for a couple of companies uh, in the coming week or weeks? Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, yes, Lisa. I'm putting <laughs> pressure on you here. <laughs> Consider uh, it you've lifted. Heard, you've, you've heard it here first. Um, <laughs> and, okay, and... Um, uh, Desoke, do you have any uh, insights into uh, sort of diaspora community? And someone said, how can we get, you know, more Nigerians interested and engaged? Um, so I think one advantage of having platforms um, such as uh, Lenderhand um, is that you have, they're able to quickly and efficiently deploy funds. And so for an individual that is interested and passionate about impact, but not quite sure how to go about it, you know, the, the kind of due diligence to do, I think platforms like Lenderhand provide a, a, good, a good way to, to invest, you know, your money and, and get some return for it. And at the same time, you know that you're, you're directly impacting the activities. Um, so that, that definitely is one way of, of, of people that are interested in, in, in Nigeria, for example, going about it. The alternative would be that, you know, 
each company sets up his own platform and then you wonder, you know, how, whether that's an efficient, I mean, that's not an efficient way to go about it. Um, so for, for those platforms that already exist, you know, I think that is one way because you're, you're dealing with people that understand the space, that are engaged with the space that, that will, would answer the questions and they provide fora like this to, to engage directly with practitioners in the space to get that kind of comfort level. I think that is, that is one of the best ways, uh, to to uh, to go about uh, being involved uh, directly in the system, except your your large ticket uh, transaction, and you can you can sign you know a very large ticket on your own and, and part of a large organization. Uh, but I, I think that that is one way. And our experience in in dealing with lender hand has been professional, and we're able to to get. I think we were on the UK platform at one time, and we're able to get. Uh, deployment, you know, quickly and efficiently. So that definitely is one way uh, of getting involved. Um, uh, yes, in, in exactly. Just, just to clarify, uh, Lend a Hand and Energize Africa. Yes, so, I'm sorry, Lend a Hand no, it's and fine. Energize Africa. Just so in case people are confused. So Lend a Hand is the Dutch platform and Energize Africa is the UK platform. Okay. For anyone listening uh, who's confused by that. Um, good. So uh, but I think it's fair to say, though, actually, uh, we're not quite sure how to uh, engage diaspora. Um, and uh, I know that in, in the work that we do with DFID, we're, we're part of a broader program called the Transforming uh, Energy uh, Access or T program. Um, there have been whole conversations around, uh, you know, how to, how to achieve this. Mm -hmm. And um, we're certainly not there yet. There's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, Lisa, also, if, for example, we want to, to target specific regions, um, each region has, is, you know, an investment network, an investment community. So even targeting their, their angel investors in Nigeria, for example, their people that are interested in investing, they want to get their hands dirty, they, they've not done it before. Speaking about Nigeria, for example, uh, so plugging into those kinds of investment um, uh, ecosystems you know, regionally um, would be one way of getting those people, the individuals that, that are in those communities to be involved in, in, in platforms uh, um, like uh, Energize and Lend a Hand uh, would, would definitely be one way. Otherwise, you find that a lot of the large ticket, a lot of the transactions that are done are large ticket transactions, and it doesn't allow a lot of smaller companies that need to, they haven't gotten to the stage of, of growth uh, uh, scaling, but they need to, to go beyond the proof of concept and, and drive their business. And they may not require $4 million right now, but they may require about 100 or 200 to be able to to get to that stage and i think there's still a gap in that area um and that's what a lot of the the, the startup uh, angel investments for example try to plug in and you know but again leveraging on energize and lend a hand with the experience the expertise and the process in, in being able to do the due diligence and deploy would give some kind of comfort level to to, to investors like that. Otherwise, we, we have the large ticket transactions and there are not that many large ticket transactions in, you know, in, in, this, in this region to do, but there are lots of smaller, smaller uh, ticket transactions uh, for businesses and, and, and co companies that are above yeah. the startup stage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, this is a really interesting conversation. And uh, if I, I may add uh, to, to what Doseke has said, uh, I think, um, you know, both uh, uh, Lend a Hand and Energize Afri Africa, you've, uh, you, you've proven the model, uh, you know, the technology is there. Um, and, uh, you know, th there are, uh, say, concentrated diaspora communities um, in, in the different, say, Western countries. So, um, I guess it, it's this question of uh, maybe coming up with tailored campaigns uh, that are targeted for the diaspora to contribute uh, into. Uh, so, you know, a bit of, say, targeted marketing uh, on, on that side. Uh, and also on the, on the receiving end, um, again, the technology is there. So, like, for example, just uh, a couple of days ago, um, M-Pesa in Kenya announced a big partnership with uh, PayPal. So, you know, uh, somebody having a PayPal account can pay directly into a, a local uh, um, mobile money uh, account as well. And I guess the diaspora uh, may be interested in funding 
um, you know, specific um, uh, communities locally. So it could be a specific household or specific um, uh, community. Um, so I, I guess you know th there is a, th there is a um, a challenge for somebody to really drive this to to bring uh, you know all this together. Um, so I think definitely this is something that could have a lot of legs. Yeah, interesting. And and there's some good ideas coming in from uh, our listeners at the moment. So thank you for that. Um, great. So uh, I think we should um, just just round out now and just give everyone an opportunity to to say you know, what their hopes are for the coming months um, and, you know, moving into, I can't believe we're almost moving into Q4 uh, already and moving towards 2021. Um, so just, okay, would you like to just start and we'll move around? Um, so for Q4, we are looking to continue to drive sales. Um, we are looking to introduce some... Um, more productive use equipment. So we're planning to launch some remote working tools uh, coming out of uh, the uh, COVID uh, epidemic. We found a lot of companies are, are working remotely but to go to, to full-time uh, work on the premises. So we're looking at trying to take advantage of that and introducing uh, more products, so diversifying our portfolio to have more productive user equipment. We're also looking at diversifying our customers, uh, customer portfolio. I think it's important as a business that we have a combination of customers that are uh, more price inelastic and those that are, that, that, as well as those that are uh, price elastic. And we find a lot of our customers at the bottom of the, of the pyramid are very price elastic they they are they are vulnerable they they don't have um a lot of buffer in terms of shocks to the system and if you imagine that 80 90 percent of your portfolio is comprised of that then it means your risk you know you're you're more exposed to risk so i think what we want to do in q4 and going forward is to also um diversify our customer base as well to have a combination of more inelastic, a good balance between inelastic and a price and elastic customers and elastic and price elastic customers, more productive use equipment, um, targeting those new customer segments with uh, uh, products that they need uh, based on what we're seeing in the environment and to just continue to be able to, to get in our products on time to solve our, our distribution uh, challenges with uh, easing of the lockdown where we're seeing some improvement in being able to, to get our goods out uh, uh, properly. And I think one other thing we want to, we do more of its partnerships. So one of the ways we're able to support in, in the achievement of SDG goals is by partnering with, uh, with different kinds of organizations to provide solutions to communities. Uh, when you look at, for example, healthcare, a lot of the healthcare solutions that have been done during the COVID has targeted cities, but you do have rural communities that have, you know, makeshift healthcare centers. They don't have sophisticated equipment and they just need basic uh, solutions uh, in, in those. So partnering with uh, organizations to be able to, to provide these kinds of, of uh, solutions, healthcare solutions, education solutions. We partner with, for example, golf, golf clubs to, to, uh, in their community development uh, programs to provide uh, televisions that have educational programs for children in their communities. Um, so those are, those are things that we want to do more of mm. um, that will benefit the community and just make sure that we are, we are building a more robust business that is able to absorb uh, uh, shocks to the system yeah. uh, would be what we're doing. Thank you. Uh, Sneha, if you'd just like to briefly add. Yeah, so uh, for us, uh, Q4 is all about, uh, you know, continuing to deliver uh, to our stakeholders. So, you know, more of the same, um, but uh, trying to do it uh, much more efficiently. I think the COVID period has uh, made us um, to, you know, realize how we can also drive much more efficiencies in our business. Um, so we've in, even brought forward uh, some of our um, uh, profitability and uh, cash flow positive uh, targets. 
Um, we are um, heavily rolling out uh, automation uh, to serve our customers better. So we're equipping uh, our agent network uh, with, uh, with smartphone uh, technology that they can use to uh, service the, the customers. And we've invested a lot uh, on there, uh, including uh, machine learning and uh, AI as well. So we're rolling that out. Um, we've also listened to our customers. Um, you know, they're, as I said, moving up the energy ladder. So they want, uh, you know, bigger and better products. So Q4, we're bringing out um, our uh, bigger TV systems with uh, uh, bigger batteries, which give them uh, more, more uh, runtime. Um, uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's basically um, making sure that uh, we're delivering to all our stakeholders, including the customers um, uh, and, of course, both the debt and equity investors. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and Tobias, I'm going, I'm going to come to you next. Um, yeah, and just to say to, to Sneha and to Soke, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing you on the platform again very soon. Um, applying some pressure again to Tobias there to uh, work with you to get that. Um, so what are your hopes then for Q4, or Tobias? Um, well, I guess, uh, you know, the past few months have been uh, sort of working in this uncertain environment and truly really trying to, um, you know, put focus and emphasis on portfolio management and trying to support the companies in the existing portfolio to see where we can help them, um, what sort of solution fits best, and also to come up with, uh, with indeed a plan to, you know, to get out of it and start increasing um, our, our exposures again, um, which we weren't fully comfortable with, you know, during COVID, um, or at least during the start of COVID. Now we're starting to see, you know, some lights at the end of the tunnel, I guess, at least uh, with respect to those uncertainties I mentioned. Um, and we have, you know, continued to build on, um, on, on pipeline. Um, and we are, you know, in the final stages of closing um, with a few new partners. So hopefully we can, you know, launch them on, uh, with them on the platform um, in, uh, in Q4 still um, to welcome some new um, highly innovative uh, social social solar companies to the to the family, um, and I guess that that would be my um, you know to 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 end this uh, this 2020 with uh, some positive notes and um, and welcome some new parties to the to the family. Great, thank you. And Rebecca, just to round it out. Sure, absolutely. Um, thanks, Lisa. So for us, I think um, we're going to continue working in a couple of key areas. I'll talk about three very briefly. I know we're out of time. Um, the first is something that we touched on in this call is the direct linkage between, uh, you know, uh, sustainable energy technologies and healthcare. And so we are working uh, on a powering health campaign uh, that's specifically focused on India and, and within India, specifically in Jharkhand, the state in India. So we're helping to develop localized task forces to help encourage exactly those types of partnerships that Dosiki was just talking about. And we're seeing some fantastic success with that so far. Um, secondly, we're doing work, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, in food security. Uh, again, trying to encourage uh, connectivity between energy access players and those in the agriculture sector. There, we're working in Uganda, um, in, an, in Mokono district, and we're actually deploying now a series of commercial um, containerized uh, milling pods. Um, and so that's going to be, um, you know, directly supporting uh, local farmers in, in the region. Um, and then thirdly, of course, as I mentioned as well, we are sort of making sure that we keep the pulse on all of any reports and research that are coming out on COVID and energy access. Um, and so, you know, checking our website or our newsletter, which comes out next week, um, you know, will be a great place to find. We're even producing a newsletter just on this topic next week. So we're really just trying to make sure that somebody is just sort of keeping track of all of the latest information that's coming out and available for the public. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, um, just to remind everyone, we'll send round uh, an email afterwards with the link to the um, session so you can always listen again and also with some useful resources. Thank you to everyone on the panel for taking part. It's been a really interesting discussion and thank you to everyone who's been listening. Um, I know we've got to a number of the questions. We haven't quite got to all of them, so apologies for that, um, but I see the panelists have been also squirreling away answering some of the questions as well. So thank you, everyone. Uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon. And um, let's speak again. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Lisa. Bye. Bye. Yeah.